Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to this little talk about camera microservices with Spring Boot and Kubernetes. Um, I was here four years ago giving a talk. Um, it was also Camel, and back then it was also some Groovy, and maybe that's why there was possible more people back then. <laughs> There's no Groovy in this title, sorry for that. So who am I? I am a software engineer from Red Hat. I've been working many, many years with Apache Camel. I uh, wrote two books on Camel. Um, one of them is actually as thick as you know, the Groovy in Action book down there in the hallway. Uh, I'm from Denmark. I have been living in Sweden for 10 years, so some people assume I'm Swedish, but no, I'm Danish. So what is Camel and what do you use it for? That's a good question. So Camel is used for system integration or just integration. So Camel is that piece of software that sits between the systems and integrate them. Now, from a developer point of view, we categorize Camel as an integration framework or integration toolbox. Now, here are the five highlights of Apache Camel. So with Camel, you build integration using enterprise best practice. Those are known as the enterprise integration patterns, which I'm going to show you in a, in a moment. Now, to connect to many different systems, Camel comes with more than 200 components out of the box. There's a broad variety of components, one from just from legacy system, mainframes, uh, enterprise systems, like traditional file, FTP servers, you know, SOAP web service, RESTful service, messaging system with DMS, RabbitMQ, AMQP, there's streaming with Kafka, there's, you know, social service like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on, and also, you know, cloud service from the big vendors like Amazon and Google and, and, and Microsoft. So there's a lot of, you know, components with Camel. This is probably one of the strong points of Camel. Another feature in Camel is that you can do data mapping and transformation. You know, you can, you know, restructure your messages between, you know, XML, Java, JSON, YAML, CSV, flat files, and so on. And there's also, you know, out of the box uh, support for some industries, uh, in particular healthcare and finance. Now, in Camel, you use, you define how systems are integrating using routes, Camel routes. And as a developer, you develop those routes in either Java code or XML. And finally, Camel comes with native support for, you know, REST and APIs. So what about enterprise integration patterns? What is that? Well, it's, that's in fact the book with that same title. So that book was published 13 years ago, and the authors of the book, uh, Rebecca Hobie and Bobby Wolf, they were you know, consultants that went from client to client back then and, and helped them with integration problems. And what they saw was the same problems occurring over and over again. So what they did was to write down notes about these problems and how to solve them. Then over time, they got accumulated more and more notes, and then the idea came to them. Hey, maybe there's a you know, reason to make that into a book. And so they did. And it's published you know, Enterprise Integration Patterns. We call it kind of like the Integration Bible. This is a very popular book, highly recommended, even today, after so many years. So in this book, we have you know, recipes for common integration problems. And those are known as Enterprise Integration Patterns. So there are patterns for, you know, one of the f most famous patterns called the content-based router. It's like an if-else in Java code or Groovy. Uh, you can filter messages, you can route the message to a dynamic, you can send the message to a number of recipients, you can split and aggregate and so on. So in Camel, what is that Camel router I talked about? So here is a very basic, simple Camel uh, route. So you have two systems a file system and a message broker using DMS. So you just want to you know, push those files to the message queue. So it's straight from and to nothing else. That's very straightforward to implement in Camel. Just say from file and then a directory name to DMS and then the name of the queue. And similar, you can do the same implementation in XML down here in the bottom. They are very similar. So let's to show a little more advanced example, so to speak. This is uh, frankly still very common to do today is to pick up files and then you need to split those files line by line and then do some sort of transformation for each line and then send that to a message system or somewhere else to further process that one. So you can go and, and use the enterprise patterns from the book and here are the four patterns. You can illustrate them, for example, in, in the whiteboard and so on. 
and see here about how we can implement that in, in, in a camel route. So we just say from file, then we want to do a split, and then we tell camel, okay, I want to split the message body using a tokenizer, and it's the new line character from the tokenizer. That means you can split it line by line. Now I want to do a message transformation. There are different ways of doing that. In this one, we are transforming from some sort of custom in-house format to XML. And there, then there's no, let's say, magic out-of-the-box uh, transformation from Camel because it doesn't know about your custom in-house format. So that's where you have to write a bit of code yourself and then plug that into Camel as we do here. And then the last thing is just to send that to the message broker. In this example, we're using Apache ActiveMQ as a message broker. So we just say ActiveMQ, and then the name of the queue is called line. So four panels is four lines of camel route code. Okay. So what about the camel architecture itself? So what is that? So this is the illustration you need to know. The one illustration is sufficient. This is like a 10,000 foot uh, overview of camel. So in the center, you have camel context. So what is camel context? Well, that is runtime camel. That is camel. So the idea is that you have this camel context, and then you can add camel routes to it. And in these camel routes, you can use these enterprise patterns where you can do routing, message transformation, filtering, calling, custom business logic, and whatnot. And then in the bottom, you have all these camel components you use to connect and integrate to different systems. So that is the camel architecture. So where can you run camel? Well, I'm a bit bold. I say you can run Camel any, everywhere. Well, Camel is based on Java. It's implemented in Java. So everywhere we can run Java, at least. You need a Java JVM. Now, Camel has been around for many years, more than 10. So it's before the cloud and all these container things. So in early days, it was more popular and more custom to run Camel using application servers. So we were building you know, a WAR files or so, something like that, and then deploy them into application servers and run applications like that. And that's a very good approach back then. It still is today, uh, commonly in use. But now there's a trend moving towards cloud and container technologies. So Camel can as easily run there as well. So you have sort of like both worlds to, at your disposal. And in this talk, I'm going to focus more on how to run Camel microservice in containers. So again, I uh, mentioned that Camel comes with more two, 200 components. And on this slide, I'm trying to illustrate four different categories of these components. So you have your traditional enterprise systems where you have file, FTP, DMS, messaging, uh, mail service, Hadoop file system, and so on, and, and various databases. Um, then you have the public cloud vendors, the three big ones from Amazon and Google and, and Microsoft. Then you also have these online SaaS offerings you know, like Salesforce and ServiceNow, SAP, and so on. These are also becoming more and more uh, popular you know, as business start to use their service. Now, in the corner, we have IoT, embedded devices. Then you may think, can Camel really run on small embedded devices like a, a fitness watch or meters or something like that? No, of course not. Camel runs on Java, and Java itself is too heavy as, you know, to run on these. But the intention is that you can use an, an agent so the intention, or gateway. So you have these small embedded devices, beacons and whatnot. Then you have sort of like a gateway, a small computer that can run Java, and then you can have Camel inside. And then the gateway can relay those messages to a back-end system where you have you know, app servers and whatnot. So on that gateway, you have Camel running with you know, components that c connect to different you know, lightweight protocols for, for IoT devices like COPE and MQTT. So that is very straightforward to implement that in with Camel. So let me try to summarize Camel. So you have this toolbox, uh, integration toolbox, that has ready-made tools for you as a developer to use to build your integration solutions. So you use these tools where you can take the best practice from the Enterprise Integration Patterns book. Then you can implement your solution in Camel routes, where you then can use Camel components to connect to many different systems. And all that together is Camel. OK, so what about running Camel in the cloud, or more precisely, running Camel with containers as a microservice? So I'm going to speak about that 
But first, a bit of background in uh, details, and then later on, some of the best practice for running camel on containers in, in the cloud. So when we're talking about containers or microservice, we are talking more about you know, moving from a traditional monolithic application to a more uh, smaller a piece called microservice, where we split up our monolithic application into smaller pieces, and those are known as microservices. So over time, the monolithic application sort of fades away, and all these microservices become more and more independent, and they also become networked and distributed. So now we have a dis different situation than before. We have distributed computing, and that's in fact hard, more hard than before. Before with the monolithic application, we had one big monolithic application running on one node, um, and now we have suddenly you know, distributed microservices running on different nodes that are communicating remotely over the network and so on. Beforehand, with the monolithic application, it was probably easier to manage that, troubleshoot it, ma maintain it, monitor it, and, and, and so on. For example, you can go to one node to check its health state, is it up or is it down. Now, for example, here on this slide, we have three microservices, A, B, and C. So to know whether or not all that is running, you, know, you have to check A, B, and C, all, all three of them. And if something goes wrong, it, you, you, it's harder to troubleshoot. Was it something that failed in A itself, or was it because when it called B, something went, uh, failed, or was it when B called C, and so on? So it's, it's harder. So what we need to do is to have some sort of um, capabilities or features to run microservices in, in the world of containers. And here's a slide showing, showing those. Um, the slide is the shape of 10, and the Greek word for 10 is deca, so this is a decagon. So what we can do is to build microservices, and those microservices can have APIs. And then you have other microservices that want to you know, connect and call your APIs, so they should be able to discover your APIs and invoke them. And also you want a platform that can scale up and scale down, so it should be elastic and resilient and so on. So there are many features we need, but where do we get them from? Where do they come from? Well, some of them come from Kubernetes. So Kubernetes makes it very easy for service to discover each other in, in the cluster. It makes it easy to invoke service in the cluster. And it can also you know, certainly scale uh, service up and down and so on. Now, um, it's also for enterprise, at least, com companies, you know, taking and using vanilla Kubernetes is actually a bit hard. So um, what we see is that enterprises are looking into a more complete solution for, for their needs. And those are known as platform as a service, PaaS solutions. There are multiple on the market. So one of them is, is Red Hat uh, OpenShift. But all of them you know, have capabilities around different things like a build pipelines. So when you build your application or microservice, you want a way of being able to be build an immutable image that you can deploy in, in, the, in the container and have sort of like a pi pipeline approach for doing all of that. You need centralized logging and monitoring and other features like that. Now in recent time, there is a new term that is gaining popularity. It's called service mesh. And out of service mesh, there's one product that is kind of standing out. It's called Istio. And Istio tries to be a solution for you know, connecting and managing your service in a more fault-tolerant and, and secure way. So with Istio, we get more uh, capabilities around you know, security and resilience and also distributed tracing and so on. And finally, when you start to have a lot of APIs, hundreds and even maybe even thousands, then you, know, you need a way of governing and managing all of these APIs. And that's where an IPA management solution can come in and, and make, make a difference. Um, for example, developers that want to reuse those APIs, they need a way of, of discovering your APIs. And so they're talking about having sort of like a uh, developer portal where they, they can see and search for these APIs and have one page, you know, uh, documentation of the APIs with examples and maybe the schema of the contract of the uh, API, like a JSON schema and so on. And that's also, you know, need a, you know, sort of like a user management solution. So, you know, when, you know, different teams or stakeholders and third parties are accessing those APIs, you need a way maybe to secure them or have API tokens so you, you can 
control them. And maybe you also need policies around rate limiting. So you, know, you can only access this API you know, 100 times a minute or so. And so there's all kinds of things around that API governments that an API management solution makes sense. But where is Camel? There's no Camel logo yet on this slide. Well, Camel is in, in the, embedded in your service. Now, Camel is Java-based, so Camel can only run with Java technologies. So in, in the, here, we can only use Camel with Spring Boot and Wi-Fi Swarm or Vertex. We cannot use Camel with Go or Node.js and something like that. So when we talk about microservices that has integration, and in, in, in containers, we are talking more about distributed integration. So here on the slide, we have service A, B, and C. And then you can ask, where does it make sense to use uh, Camel or integration? Well, one, one area where it makes sense is or maybe on the edges. So on service C, for example, that we need to integrate with a service that runs outside the cluster, an external system. Now, Camel comes with more than 200 components, so it, there's a chance there's a component that can connect and, and, and integrate with that system. Uh, that system may not you know, be modern HTTP REST, it may be a legacy system, a traditional database, it can be a FTP even or something like that. So you can use Camel and Camel components for that. Also pay attention that not all of, all of these services has Camel. So you only, you, the, the thing is that now Camel is so lightweight and you can take integration where it needs. So in this situation, we only need integration capabilities in A and C. There's no uh, integration capabilities needed in B, for example. That is a difference than a traditional way where beforehand with SOA and ESB platform, it was sort of like a big centralized platform where all the integration has to run on a centralized platform. Now, instead, we can distribute that and just take in lightweight camel and use only where we need it with microservice. When companies start to go down the avenue of uh, being DevOps and Agile and, and doing integration, then we're talking about you know, coining that into a, a concept called Agile integration. Agile integration has three key concepts or pillars, if you will. So we have distributed integration. That is Camel. This is the bread and bread of Camel. This is where you use these Camel to you know, build uh, integrations where you can use these enterprise patterns and so on. Then you need a, it's a very robust and highly available platform to run your microservice and integration, sort of like in a cloud native way. That's where containers come in, where you can run that based on you know, Kubernetes, for example. And then you know, need a way of having you know, reusable APIs. And that's where the APIs come in. So that's the agile integration. Integration, containers, and API. So, what about some of the best practice of running Camel in the, in the cloud or with containers? Or microservice, if you will. So one of the first practice or best practices is to be small in size, you know, being very lightweight. So Camel is lightweight in the sense that it's a Camel core jar, which is around four megabytes. And then you have a lot of components you can choose among. You just piecemeal and choose, I want this component, that component, that's together, and nothing else. And then you, you can choose a runtime to use that. Spring Boot, uh, Vertex, Wi-Fi Swarm, even uh, Apache Carafe can also be chosen, or even without a runtime, you can also just Java main, for example. But anyway, it is the intention that there's a small Java runtime and you can embed Camel together so you can be small in size. Also, a good pattern is to be stateless, favor to be stateless. Now, that's not always the case you can be that. And there are different you know, ways that you can uh, get access to state. So for example, Camel has integration with a number of data grid uh, solutions like uh, JBoss InfiniSpan, uh, Hazelcast, Apache Ignite, and so on. So you can easily, with Camel, integrate to those to you know, have some sort of repository for your, your state. You can also use storage, persistent storage for your state, you know, traditional SQL databases or Kafka or something like that, or Redis or something. And Kubernetes itself comes also with a concept for stateful. It's called a stateful set. 
Um, another practice is that when you run in containers, it's around configuration management. Now, the intention is that with containers, you build them as immutable containers or image, and then you run them. Then the intention is that you externalize your configuration from the image. And then when you run it um, as a container, then you get the configuration injected into, into the running container. And Kubernetes support that uh, in two ways. Either it can inject the configuration using environmental variables, or it can be injected using files. So the files are, for example, on the Java class part or on the file system itself. Now, on top of that, there are two distinctions in Kubernetes around configuration management. There are one called config map. That is the standard one. It's just like a key value pairs. And then there's one called secrets. So it's, it's in fact the same thing, but secrets are used for sensitive data like passwords and certificates and other things. Now, Spring Boot and Camel comes with great support for configuration management via Spring Boot. Uh, Spring Boot just has this add value and then squiggly dollar and then the name of the key you want to look up and have injected automatic. Uh, Camel itself uh, also has support for that, but pay attention to the syntax. It's a bit different. In Camel, it's like instead of dollar squiggly, it's squiggly squiggly. <clears throat> now, also, a great practice around microservices and integration is around fault tolerance. You need to build your uh, service as fault tolerant because this. And Camel comes with two you know, areas of around that, uh, client-side retries and circuit breakers. And circuit breakers is around history. So we're going to see that in, a, in the demo later. So client-side retries or Camel retries, if you will, here's an example of that. So we have... Uh, a hello service, the blue one, and then the camera as a client want to call that service. And as you can see, the first three attempts fails, and then it succeeds on the fourth time. That's a good way. In Camel, you can specify, you can tell Camel, okay, if there's an, object on it, an exception, I want to call it up till 10 times, and then, you know, one second delay. That's a way of doing this. And you may think this is a good way, you know, but there are some use cases where it's not a good way to use client-side retries. For example, here in, in the center, we have a you know, downstream service that is sort of like being used by many upstream service, uh, a relevant service. Now, all these upstream services are calling that service, and it's under stress. It cannot handle the load. It fails and so on. And then because all of these upstream services have you know, retries, they just keep on calling the same service over and over again. And then you have more and more load on it. And, it's, it's, and, and that is sort of like known as the thundering herd problem. You know, you have a lot of cows in the, in the herd, and they come running down towards you, and, you know, there's nothing you can do to stop that. So that is not always a good situation. There's a different approach to this, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Another practice is around when, uh, health checks. So you need your microservice to have some sort of uh, health checks built in. So the platform knows the state of your health, uh, applications. And Kubernetes comes with two kinds of that. Uh, they are called probes, readiness probes and liveness probes. And there's a distinction between the two of them. So a readiness probe is used to know when your application or microservice is ready. And that's used for doing a startup. So when you start up, for example, Spring Boot with Camel and you need to analyze a few things, it takes some time. Java itself is not super fast. And that's where you want sort of like to tell Kubernetes, okay, I'm not still ready. You know, I'm booting up and whatnot. Now I'm ready. And when you're ready, then Kubernetes will start to service your traffic. Otherwise, it will not. So it will give you time to start up. Now the other one, Leibniz probe, is used during when your application is running to know are you still alive. Yes, yes, like a ping check, for example. So there are two ways of that. So you need both of them, actually. Now, out of the box, uh, Camel and Spring Boot comes with health checks uh, out of the box. In Spring Boot, it's called the uh, out actuator. And there's also Wildfire Swarm if you, they have something they call monitor. And on the slide, you can see the Spring Boot health check. And Camel, <coughs> excuse me, is embedded inside, so we have the Camel health check as well. And all of these are you know, up, so the total status is up. So what about the enterprise integration patterns and, and running those as microservice in the, in the cloud. Is there any 
danger to them. No, they work anywhere. Uh, the book, Enterprise Integration Patterns, was you know, authored or written before the cloud and containers and all that kind of things. So, um, so those patterns are universal. So they work beforehand and they also work today. So I'm coming back to the about fault tolerance, you know, that thundering hurt problem. Now there's a pattern for that, it's the circuit breaker pattern. And there's a famous implementation in that in Java, it's called uh, Hystrix from Netflix. So in Netflix, they are heavily using uh, circuit breakers, uh, Hystrix, to protect the service. And Camel has out of the box uh, support for that. So in the Camel route like this one, we are saying, you know, from Hystrix, and then whatever we put inside here is protected by a Hystrix circuit breaker. And then if there's some kind of errors, we can execute optional if we want and fall back and then do some uh, different computation. Um, there's a famous um, use case for that in the real life. So in the United Kingdom, Sky Sports, uh, you know, broadcast, you know, uh, movies, but also, you know, Premier League football games. So sometimes when there's a high demand for a game like Manchester United versus Liverpool or something like that, then you know a lot of people want to see that game. But you have to be a subscriber to access the Premier League game. So you go to the website and log in, and then you can see the game. Now, they had a, a login service that was under stress. So if they did not you know, use the circuit breaker around that one, that just set a fallback saying you can log in, yes, and then you know, they can still see the game, right? And they didn't care because, you know, what are the chances that someone who's not a subscriber actually, you know, managed to figure out, okay, I can actually see that game for free today. You know, that's, even so, if there's just one guy doing that, that's fine because they would rather have all the other existing subscribers be happy to see the game instead of having them call them and be really angry because they want to see the game live. They don't want to see it tomorrow. So that's a, that's a very good use case. But of course, there are other situations where it doesn't really make sense, you know, money transferring and finance and so on, you know. I'm sending you some money, and if it fails, you know, you don't get the money. <laughs> now, there's also a, a pattern for microservices in the cloud around transactions. You know, traditionally, we had to think about transactions sort of like an you know, all or nothing thing. So like a two-phase commit, you know, typically around messaging and databases. So you can start from a message and read into a database and everything goes, it commits or it fallbacks, rollbacks. Now with containers and distributed computing and so on, that is much harder. And also the, the way we integrate things today are not typically only DMS and databases and Java technologies. It's a lot of different things, REST calls and so on. So there are some new patterns around that, the Saga pattern. Um, so there's an implementation um, in the microprofile uh, ecosystem um, where they, wanna impl they are implementing a Saga orchestration manager, sort of like, like a trans transaction manager. And that's a, Camel has integration with that, with the Saga pattern. Um, and now you can also use this uh, the Saga pattern for long running action, they call it. So, you know, a traditional with a two-phase commit, it was sort of like a, supposed to be a short thing, you know, not spanning hours or minutes or days. But the long-running action uh, can actually do that. So it can also be sort of used for human workflows, if you want. Um, on the slide, there is a, a, a sequence diagram. It's around, you know, booking systems. So you try to book a train seat, and you know, then you try to book a hotel or something like that. And, you know, if the train train seat is okay and then the hotel, there's no rooms, then you can you know, issue a compensation action to the train ticket or you, you can cancel it and so on. So that's the intention of it. Uh, and finally, when you start to run a lot of microservices in, in containers, you need a way of monitoring that or, you know, typically you have like a business transaction that may span many different microservices. So you want to be able to correlate and trace what's going on with that business transaction, which of all these microservices did it call because sometimes they can branch and uh, fork, join, and so on. And so, so for that, you need distributed tracing. And in the community, there are different open source projects around that. Uh, open tracing and Zipkin are you know, popular, and Camel has uh, integration with them. So if you go back to the Decagon slide and look at where do we have some camel capabilities to this one that makes sense to use? Well, certainly 
and first mode is around uh, invoking service. You know, camera comes with more than 200 components, so you can build service using different kind of technologies, not only within your cluster, but also especially external cluster, uh, externally outside the cluster. Also around, actually around, you know, building fault tolerant applications. Even though, you know, new technologies like Istio is emerging, then it can make sense to use camel retries or, or the camel hysterix because it gives, you know, the, the Java develops the power. You can write whatever, you know, you can control it there, whereas Istio is outside and it's sort of like running you know, on a on a side by side and proxy in between and, and doing the, the fault tolerance thing. And if you do that, then you don't have that fallback thing, you know, like the sky sports, you know. There's no fallback in, in their circuit breaker, so to speak. And also history is uh, a battle tested Java implementation of that pattern, you know. It's heavily used in, in, in for example, Netflix and others, where Istio is a new product. It's not yet 1.0, but you know, it's getting there. Okay, so now we are going to uh, uh, demo time. Let's see if the Wi Fi works. And this is my, one of my famous uh, favorite camel. It's a Lego camel. And we are in the country of Lego. Unfortunately, not, I have not seen a Lego set with a camel. <laughs> I wish there were. So this is a basic demo. So we have a Hello service. It, it does actually use Wi-Fi Swarm as the runtime, but it doesn't really matter. It's just to show that camel is adaptable. You can use to run it on any of those. And then as a client, we want to invoke that service. Both of them are running camel. And then you know we're going to play around with the container a bit uh, or the cluster a bit and, and test the fault tolerance and see what things going wrong and so on. So, so OK. So first of all, let me just show the camera for that client that calls the service. So I don't want to push a button every time I want to call a service. So I do have a camera route that starts from a timer. So every second that route triggers. Then I'm using this circuit breaker using Hysterix. And then I call the service here using HTTP. And the name of the service is called Hello Swarm, and it runs on port 8080. And then if there's a problem, there's a fallback, and I just say set a, set a body, message body, to a uh, constant. And that one is actually coming from the configuration management here, as, a, as, a, as a config map in Kubernetes. And then I log it. So that's very basic. So I have already deployed and running that application in the cluster. So I can actually call this also from a web browser. So this is, it says swarm says hello from, and then there's a name. And this is uh, the name of the pod or the container that runs it. And you can see it's like a dynamic name. This is where because Kubernetes assigns a dynamic host name to all the running containers. And that's actually good for demos because we can see that name should change over time if we start and stop and whatnot. So inside, um, I'm running on a local Kubernetes cluster called Minishift. It's uh, based on OpenShift, but it doesn't really matter. It's Kubernetes. It could also use Minikube. Uh, I'm actually just using Minishift because the last time I gave a talk, it was a Red Hat Summit, and then they were, you know, favoring Red Hat technologies. However, it does seem there is a web console that for Minishift that is, you know, that uh, that's better than what you can get from Kubernetes itself. So I have deployed the Hello Swarm application here, and then the client app, uh, application is not running yet. So what I can do is just to click this button up here, and now it's scaling that application up to one one pod or one container, if you will. So that one is, is starting up. You can see the blue, light blue one is, uh, is, is starting. It's not ready yet. So the container is booting up. And when it becomes dark blue, it's, it's ready. And if you go to the uh, up here, let me just kill that one. I can say cube, get pods. And I can see here, this is community, Kubernetes client. Client Hystrix is now ready, 1-1. One, one. So it should be running. So I can, choose, I can tail its locks. And as you can see, it's calling that service every second, right? And it says, hello, swarm, blah, blah, blah. That looks very good. So that's fine. But let's try. OK, this is uh, supposed to be a fault tolerant application. So let me try to scale up the, the service to have two parts running. And we should be able to see this guy, you know, call both of them. And 
well, okay, no, nobody want to talk to me, and now, yeah, okay, don't see that. Um, something is happening. I'm drinking, okay. Or maybe you can see now there are two different, right? Can you see the host name is a bit different? And that's good. And it seems like it's, can anybody see what strategy we're using for you know, round robin? That's a very good answer, but, but that was good three years ago. It used to be round robin, but Google did a lot of analytics on their, you know, and they found out that it's actually better to use random. So it's actually random by default. If you use round robin, there's a chance, you know, you can actually, in, you know, it can sort of give a side effect because it's predictable. But you can choose, you can also implement your own. For example, Istio allows that, so you can have more, you know, based on CPU usage or the uh, zones or geographical locations and all kinds of things like that. So, but there was a problem when I booted it up there was this nobody want to talk to me. I scaled it up to two. I told Kubernetes, okay, I have one. Now I scale it up to two. And it should be robust and highly available. And this will be just work like Unicorn platform. Everything is talking about this is so awesome. But why did it fail? Anybody had like a clue? I actually built it on purpose. Yes, you are uh, correct in the sense that if I go over to the, oh, sorry, I have to choose here. So the Hello Swarm application is booting up. So I scale the Hello Swarm application up from one to two. And while it scales up, it takes time for the Java itself to boot up. It takes time for Spring Boot or Swarm itself to boot up. And only when it's really ready. a bit lazy. So I am, when I built this application, I can use a Maven plugin called Fabricate Maven plugin. It can build a Docker image for that. And it comes with sort of like an opinion way. It looks like your project is in Spring Bool Swarm, whatnot, and it has some defaults. And it set up, you know, liveness checks uh, and readiness probe. But there's a bug in an old version of it. 3.3.5 has a bug. In that bug, it disables, there's no readiness check. So if I upgrade that one to the latest one, it will just work, and there will no errors, right? So, but the point is that when you build application on microservices for the world of containers in Kubernetes and whatnot, the things can go wrong. Even when you have a cluster, you're going to boot up until it one scale from one to two, it can still fail. So you need to have that on the service side with the probes, and also on the other side. Even so, they have readiness taken over or not. It can still fail. What if there's all the all the containers are down. There's no active service. So you need, you know, fault tolerance on both sides, where you host the service and also on the client side. On the client side, that's where we have camel retries or circuit breakers. So let, let's continue a bit with that. I scale this down to, to one, so there's only one of them, because now I want to play a bit and kill it and whatnot and see from the client side what can go wrong. So we go here. This one is, is, is just exit, calling the same one because we told Kubernetes to scale it down to, to one. Now I can actually just kill this one. I can delete it. So I can say Kubernetes delete part, and it's going to be deleted. And this guy, you know, every time we call it, there's nobody, and it goes like that, right? And then what, what the intention is that Kubernetes is built around this self-heal healing. So you have this desired state. So desired state in Kubernetes is to you configure it, to, there should be one part running with this swarm application. So what Kubernetes will continue monitor the cluster and try to achieve that state. This is the happy state. So if there's zero, it will try to you know, start up a new part with that application. Or if there are two, it will scale it down to one. So this is the always constantly try to you know, give the happy state. And it doesn't matter how that part is, is deleted, you know. I can even, you know, uh, let me go here, Docker PS. I can kill it outside Kubernetes because when I tell Kubernetes to delete it, you actually tell it to yourself, I'm going to delete that one. Then, and this guy calling it, you know, it's, it all, you, you tell it ahead of time. 
But what if in real life, you know, that's the entire rack goes down, you know, Kubernetes doesn't know, it's just gone. So I can go a bit behind the curtain using Docker, and there's a Docker process here for, oh, I have to find the right one. Uh, can anyone see that one? Oh, here. So this is the first one. This is the process ID in Docker. So I can say Docker kill, and it should be killed, and you can see it's, it's nobody stuck, stuck to me. If I go down here, cube get parts. Uh, it's it's already started in one in one new way in one one, and now it's running up there. Now that's fine and all, but what if I want to see um, the state of my, my circle breakers? Then you can also see them visually. So there's a web console that can view the entire cluster, for example. But we only have one right now, so there's only one here, and everything is green. That means the circle breaker is good. Um, uh, so it says close. So the attention, the problem with the circle breaker is that it takes a little while to, you know, get the grasp of it. It just open and closed. So close is like a bridge is closed, so they can pass through. If it opens, then you cannot go on the other side, and then you know it it, it falls back. But you, you, you can also look at the colors. Green is good, like traffic light, and red is bad. So now it runs here. But let's try to just to say we delete the same part. So if I delete that part, we should see here on the circle breaker, you know, things change. You can see now the graph has changed. Now the circle breaker is open. You know, all everything is fall back. Then the circle breaker will once in a while let uh, a request go through, just to probe if it's up and running again. And if a number of those are starting to be successful, then you know it can change the state to being closed again and green. Now you can see this one is reacting pretty fast on up and down. Now Hysterix was built by Netflix, and they have a high throughput system. So out of the box, the circle breaker is sort of like custom for them, you know, for their optimal way, where they have a high throughput. So when you use it by normally uh, for a sm small sample of data, it will not react as fast because it's, that's just normal. It doesn't really matter so much. So you have to tweak it for your settings, which I have been doing here in my Camel application. Um, in the Spring Boot file here, I have these two settings here, where I'm, you know, saying okay, there's the volume threshold is only two. By default, it might be two twenty or something like that. So this is where you have to go and, and tweak a bit for your for your needs if if you want to have it react really much faster. Otherwise, it may take a half a minute before it takes this okay and then and goes back. Okay, so. I think that's the demo. Let me go back to the slides. Then, when you start to go down using containers, and, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if you, I am from a traditional Java background. You've been developing Java applications for so many years with uh, traditional app servers, Java E, and all that kind of things, and not so much Linux. You know, even though I worked for Red Hat, so. What I'm saying is that with this new cloud and containers and Kubernetes, there's so much new thing to learn, and there's so much non-Java thing, and there's so much more ops thing and Linux and whatnot. So there's a lot to learn, and it's actually quite hard to learn it. Uh, so there's this. You can't really read the, the details on this pyramid, but there's a, a building from UK wrote a nice article on uh, DZone, on InfoQ and whatnot, I sort of got you know circulated quite a lot, and it's just to show you that there are so many different concepts to learn, and there are some you know uh, words about them here. You know, you know how does you know persistent stores work here and whatnot. So there's a lot of thing to look into it. This is, can be an inspiration, you know. And speaking of, where can you get, find more information? So if you're a Java developer and want to build a you know, microservice that can run for containers, there's a free book here written by Kristen Poster, who is a consultant from UK. And he shows you how you can build these Spring Boot and, and Drop Wizard and other microservice applications and, and get those, those you know, ready for, for, for containers with you know, fault tolerance and all that kind of things. There's no camel covers in the book, so that's the only drawback there is. But you know, it's a great book anyway. Um, 
Now, if you want to learn a lot more about you know, Kubernetes itself, there's a Kubernetes in Action book. Uh, it's a very recommended book. covers all these concepts and so on. And, you know, I have to plug my own book, Camera in Action. Um, in fact, the second edition was just published here in, in February. And there is a discount code for it, Camera 3.9, if you order it directly from the publisher, Manning. But just be aware, if you're based here in Europe, you might get import tax. So even if you get the discount, you might have to pay import tax for it. So sometimes it's just easier to order from Amazon in, in UK or Germany. Um, there's also a great conf, uh, discount code that is circulating on Twitter. It gives 40%, but that's for every book for Manning. But it works only in a limited time. This one is more or less always on. I do have that. We once in a while have a, like a push for, for the book. So Manning creates a new discount code, but it only works for a temporary time. Um, so we had a Camel 50 month. So, but, you know, it has to be that, you know, Camel or Manning is not, you know, IT savvy. So they sometimes, you know, have discount codes that doesn't expire. So you can actually try if you want to say Camel 99, Camel 98, <laughs> until you, you find the right one. But all, uh, Camel 39, as long as I know, has been working. So again, just for where can you find the slides and the uh, source code are used here? If you go on GitHub and find me, um, Daus Klaus, there's a product called Camel Writers in the Cloud. This is where I, my recent talks are. And there are you know, slides and demo for different uh, conference. And you can find it in one for great conf. The Camel website, of course, for Camel itself, I have to say that it looks a bit outdated. And yes, we are aware of that. We are working on building a new website and documentation. It will not be complete before, definitely after the summer break. You know, it will take time, but we are, we are there. There's a lot of, it's about 3,000 pages of Camel documentation on the website. Um, we do have migrated most of them because they are from the components itself, but now it's the more generic user, user guides, and those have to be more hand migrated, and so that's why it takes time, and then come up with a great look and feel. That's the... Um, ASCII Dog is the is the new one, so we can you know export that to different platforms like HTML, but also eBooks and PDF files and so on. And there's also a new Camel logo. This is the one I have here. And if a colleague of yours asks what is Camel, then the third link is one of the best. What is Camel kind of thing, even though it's maybe eight years old. Uh, five minutes read, get him a cup of coffee, and he can just go and read that one. And the last one is actually, if you are, we do have some webinars that are recorded and posted on YouTube on different topics, so service mesh and Kubernetes and, and Camel and other things, you can find them there. It's kind of broad spectrum of different technologies. They tend to be quite smaller, like 20 minutes, 25 minutes, so that's also a good way of finding more information. So now I will open up for Q&A. can also ask, you know, generic camel questions. How do you see the uh, role of camel in uh, the uh, Java web space? Has uh, changed during the uh, 10 years, and what do you see camel being used for in the future? That's a very good question. So definitely camel has a role in the future as well, definitely, uh, because integration is actually much more needed than beforehand. And now you can take cam integration where it's needed, but I'm talking about the lightweightness and then embedded medium microservice. Um, so it's actually, there's more choices for developers now to pick up and, and use Camel before, and it might be a company decision that we have to use an Oracle, ESP, whatever platform. Um, now, I know that Camel is, is 10 years old, so you also have to consider that. Is it old technology, is it legacy and whatnot, or some set old craft software? No, definitely not. Um, but we do have to respect uh, the existing user base quite a lot, right? So we can't really throw them under the bus and rewrite Camel like so many other people are doing. So what I see the, the, the role of Camel is that there will be more popular runtimes. Uh, Spring Boot is one, but there's also the one that was announced here from GreatCon with uh, Graham Rocker's new product, the microservice runtimes and whatnot. Camel is not trying to compete with them. We are trying instead of to work well with them. So we are 
seeing that you know, Camel, you just embed together with whatever runtime you have and use that. So Camel has all these connectors and components, and you, know, you don't have to use an entire Camel route and ERP patterns all the time. It's just that if you need to connect to some system that is not like the trad traditional RESTful or whatever, that's where Camel can make sense. And now, we also wear that you know, directive way of things that is also becoming quite popular in some circles, but you know, that may be the most elite developers that are more, you know, can grasp the concept around, you know, uh, reactive programming and all that kind of, also the APIs of that is quite harder than traditional programming. But we know that this is also a choice that Camel uh, uh, need to be on the roadmap for. And you can use that today, there are Camel reactive components, but they are, let's say, they don't feel like first class citizen inside Camel itself, but they are sort of like on the side. So for Camel 3, we are working on having a Camel reactive routing in it, so it's first class inside Camel, but it's it's a dual thing. We want to have the traditional one we have today. So the existing user base can continue using that. There won't be any change for them. It can still run. And then if you choose, you can use the new routing engine. And ideally, it will be sort of like under the, under the switch, under the hood. You can switch it over to use the new one. And then maybe as a client side, we integrate with Camel. That is more reactive API as well. So that's where we are going in, in the future for Camel 3. And this is something that we'll, we'll get working on for real, for hot after the new website and all that is, is done. So this is something we'll work on in, on the second half of this year. And hopefully Camel 3 will come out in the start of next year or in, in the next year. I have to say that we want to do a Camel 3 that is more step-by-step. Uh, -step. So we want to get an early release out of Camel 3 with that reactive thing and then you know, mature that over a couple of releases. Because I don't think that we can, you know, it may take a, more than a year to really you know, get that done. And if we stop all the other activities around Camel for a year, that you know, that's that's not good. Also, I have to say that we also see that there's a new space around what you call lightweight integration or low code, no code kind of thing. They, Martin Fowler called it the citizen users. So citizens use like a business person should be able to do some sort of lightweight integration from an email to a Salesforce account or something like that. So there are new products coming around that. Don't, it's not functional, all that kind of thing. But at Red Hat, we have a product for that. It's called Synthesis. Synthesis is the open source product name. And then the Red Hat is called Fuse Online or Fuse Ignite. And it has a web, fully web GUI where you drag and drop and configure all that kind of thing. But the best thing is that it builds a, a runtime image with Camel inside. So it's also, so you have that, that hybrid. And it also resonates with those users because they can build have developed build Camel components and whatnot and integrate that with the, with the citizen users so they can use them. So you can you know, have both people work together. So it does definitely have a great view in that area as well because, and because Red Hat you know, is, has a product on it now, so we will have you know, them sponsor more and more committers to it. But again, it's a dual end because we do have the 10 years legacy thing to consider and you know, work better with other runtimes. Uh, other questions or is Okay, so thank you. <laughs>